Good morning, Rehoboth and friends. We are so, so glad that you chose to join us in worship this morning. And we want to welcome you into the house of the Lord and welcome you into this hour of worship where we're going to focus on the next generation, our all family worship. And we, we appreciate so, so much for our families being here with us today. I had my family a week early last week, but... Uh, I do have my husband now. There we go. Hi. <laughs> Can't start without him. So, so glad that you chose to give this hour to the Lord with us this morning. Whether you're joining us in this room or online, let me just thank you for sharing this time with us. We want to invite you to lift high the name of Jesus as we celebrate how good our God is. Would you stand to your feet? Would you sing with us about the goodness of God? He is good. He is faithful. His love endures for all generations. Would you stand? Would you sing? Would you clap your hands? Would you celebrate the goodness of God? Here we go. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures.
in this declaration. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to those of you who are new, to those of you who have been here. For those of you that are new, to my left, your right, there is a welcome table. We would love to get to know you. And for those of you online, drop a comment or email us. We would love to get to know you as well. Today at 4 p.m., we have good news training. We would love to see you there. 
You can find more information on that at rehoboth.org slash goodnews. And next Sunday, you need to mark your calendar as well, because we are ordaining J.D. Bush to pastoral ministry. He will be a new teaching pastor. And then something else I'm very excited about. I mentioned it a few weeks ago, last time I was up here. We have Trunk or Treat coming up, and we need a lot more candy. So you can donate candy up front, I'm pretty sure. Yes, up front you can donate candy. The kids need it. I need it. We all need it. Love to see you guys there, and thank you for your donations. And finally, thank you for your generous giving. You can give by text, by mail, or in person against those three tables in the back. Thank you, guys. Good morning. Y'all come this way. Sit right here. So my name is Tina Bush, and I am the children's ministry director here at Rehoboth. I'm also your pastor's wife. And we are going to share something with you. We have been hiding God's word in our heart so that we may worship him. And so our kids are going to lead us in our scripture this morning. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 18-20. Thank you, guys. All right, y'all can, y'all can go find your family, okay? Are you keeping yours? Okay. Y'all can go find your family. So, um, we have some great things going on in the children's ministry. And I just want to tell you, if you're not getting to know the next generation of kids in this church, you are missing out. Yeah. I encourage you, if at all possible to come and spend time with them, invest in them, help them to grow. They love Rehoboth, and so we want that to increase as they grow up, and we want them to know all of us. We want them to feel a part of us, and so I encourage you, please, come and help us in the children's ministry. We, have, we do have a great group of kids every age, and then also you'll get to know my seven grandchildren as well, so... <laughs> Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just commit this time to you. We are here to worship you, Lord. We're not here for ourselves. We are only here for you. Thank you for these children this morning who have hidden your word in their heart, who have remembered the last words that Jesus said to us on the earth before he left. Lord, we pray that as they grow up, they will learn to love you with their whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. We pray that you will send workers to help increase that knowledge and love for you. Lord, I pray this morning for our church family. We pray for those who couldn't be with us this morning, that you would restore their health, that you would return them to us next Sunday. Lord, we pray for the things that are going on in our community and in our world. Lord, we pray for um, just your hand to be upon all situations. Lord, we pray for peace in the world. We pray that um, your, your justice would be done. Lord, we pray that as we continue to worship you, that all that we think, say, and do would bring honor and glory to you alone. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Y'all are doing a great job. I, I, will, I do need that one. Thank you. <laughs> hey, Gary, can you turn a couple mics off up here as I ask for them? I may not be able to sing, but I can cut the mic. <clears throat> um, hey, it is so good for us to be able to worship like this. What a beautiful, beautiful picture of what God is doing in this church family. In our student ministry, 
uh, one of the things that we do almost every Sunday morning is we have Bible drills so that our students can know more and more, not simply about particular Bible verses, but also where to find them in the Bible and become very familiar with God's Word. So we've got four of our students that are going to come up here and join me this morning. If y'all would go ahead and come up on the platform, Abigail, if you'd make your way over. All right, so this is only four of our students, but this is four who have earned the right to be up here this, this morning. So Abigail, and Abigail, help me make sure I pronounce your last name right. Himara? Himera. Abigail Himero, Johnny Dye, Joseph Morrow. Ha <laughs> ha, I got it, didn't I? And Chloe Girton. And so you thought I'd forgotten, didn't you, Joseph? And I didn't even look at my notes, did I? Yeah, almost forgot. So they have done an outstanding job. All of our students have. Some weeks we actually have some prizes. They have really excelled in knowing God's word. So what they're going to do, I'm going to give them a passage of scripture. I'm going to announce it twice, tell them go. First one to get it is going to step forward. Then I'm going to take the mic and place it over there. They're going to tell you what the reference is and read that passage of scripture with you this morning. So y'all get your Bibles, get ready. Here we go. Acts 1-8. Acts 1-8. Go. All right, Johnny. <laughs> but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witness in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Well done. Very good. Y'all give him a hand. So they already know this, the way the rules go, whoever wins this Bible drill next Sunday is going to get a beautiful leather-bound Bible, and uh, we're going to be excited to be able to present that to you. Whoever wins twice, the first person to win twice, will actually win our overall round. So y'all don't let Johnny get this very next one, all right, or we'll be done. <laughs> all right, here we go. Genesis 45.5. Genesis 45, 5. Go. Uh, Y'all did it again. They, they are constantly like right together. So I think Chloe stepped first. I think. Did she? She did. Okay. I thought, yeah, y'all don't, don't look at me like, well, I don't know. I, don't leave me hanging like that. All right, I'm pretty certain, Abigail, I really did. I think I saw her step first. All right, Chloe. Genesis uh, 45, 5. And now do not be distressed or angered with yourself because you sold me here. For God sent me before, before you to preserve life. Very good. Y'all give her a hand. By the way, ahead of time, they were not told where we would be looking for these verses. So this is the first time they've been called on to find these particular verses. So the, second, the third one we're going to do is Luke 10, verses 25 to 27. Luke 10, 25 to 27. Go. All right, yeah, Joseph, you got it. <clears throat> Luke chapter 10, verse 25 through 27. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Well done. All right. Exodus 3.14. Exodus 3.14. Go. All right. This time. 
So three-way or two-way? Two-way time. Two, I, I'm pretty certain these two stepped up at the exact right time. Right. Y'all need to stop. No? Thank you. All right, this is not going as planned. Right, exactly. So, uh, uh, Abigail, I do think they stepped up before you did. But I do think y'all stepped up at the exact same time. They did. So, here's what we're going to do. I want y'all to read it together, okay? Exodus three fourteen. God, God said to Moses, I am who I am. I am. And he, he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. Very good. Y'all give him a hand. All right. Since y'all both have already won one prior to that one, correct? Okay. Y'all are in the finals to win. So this one's just for the two of you. Okay. Who, whichever one of you gets this one then wins. Ready? Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Go. Joseph. <laughs> Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And G oh, Matthew uh, chapter 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Ah, very good. I want you to notice of all of them, and this would be true of our entire student group, they have taken it seriously to get to know where the books of the Bible are so that they can find God's word. I think some of y'all would still be looking in the Old Testament for like Acts, but they zip to them. I am so proud of y'all. I'm so proud of the young people you are. I'm so proud of our student ministry. Let me pray for us and then we'll let our worship team continue to lead us. Father, thank you for the beautiful day you've given us and thank you for these young people. Lord, you have blessed our church richly with children and students and adults of all ages. Father, indeed, we are grateful that you have made us a church of the generations and a church of the nations. Father, we walk before you knowing that our adversary seeks to destroy these young people. Father, I pray that your hand be upon the next generation in our church family. That God, we would be faithful, diligent, generous, and intentional about reaching them with the gospel and raising up strong gospel warriors of these young men and young women that your hand of protection would be around all of them. Thank you for a church that loves them dearly and invests in them generously. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Hey, y'all let our students know how much you love them. Not just them, but all of them. Y'all did a great job. The focus is on the next generation. The story is the same for every believer, young and old. God's grace is sufficient. Amen and amen. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. How sweet the 
sound that saved a wretch like me. But now I'm found I was blind But now I see T'was grace that taught My heart to fear And grace my fears That grace appeared the hour I first believed. He dangers, toils, and snares I have borne. song that has an enduring message. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yesterday, He's just as good as He was 88 years ago, isn't He, Brother Charles? Amen. Amen. And He's going to be the same God. Would you sing this song with us? I'm calling on the God of Jesus. Whose love endures through generations I know that you will keep your covenant I'm calling on the God of Moses The one who opened up
we're standing on your faithfulness. Every promise you have is yes and amen. And we thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, that we can count on you when the world all around us is shaking and sinking sand. Lord, you are our solid rock. And we thank you, Jesus, for what you are. God, we thank you that it's you we can trust in. And all of God's children said, amen, amen, and amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much. I think one of the really neat things about Dr. Wallace's story is that he was not a pastor. He was not a preacher. He was uh, 17 years old, and he was going to be um, an auto mechanic. He just felt God speak to him and say, I want you to be a a medical missionary. He went to China in 1935. There was constant unrest. World War II started, the Japanese came in. At one point, they decided to pack up the hospital and move upriver ahead of the Japanese. His life verse was Philippians 121, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And he really showed that. He, he showed that in his life and how he lived and how he died. The missionaries in China at the time when the communists came in were given the option to leave and a number of them did. He felt compelled to stay. God knows what he called Bill to do and Bill did what he felt God called him to do. I really think it's important for kids to know the stories of people who sacrificed and they need heroes. We need good solid heroes for our kids. Bill Wallace would say he's not a hero but um, his story is certainly inspiring as he lived out his faith and obedience to God. Bill Wallace served with the International Mission Board one of our key missions partners, a mission sending organization under which my family served in Eastern Europe with. Bill Wallace's story is special to me because while he died on the mission field, was martyred on the mission field before I ever even knew anything, one of the missionaries who had such a profound impact in my life, his impact still resonates to this day, was a teenager when word came that Bill Wallace had been killed. And in that moment, in that time, God called that teenager to serve as a missionary. And he and his family did. They lived in Asia for many, many, many years serving there faithfully. And I had a chance to be mentored by him. When they found Bill Wallace in his cell, those who were allowed to take him out and bury him, He'd been beaten, tortured, starved. When they found his body, he was on his knees and he'd been praying. And that's how he died. When we think about moments like that, when we think about the beauty and grandeur and glory of God's story going to the ends of the earth. We celebrate like we've been doing all morning long and the beautiful flags and and our hearts and minds are drawn toward global missions and even toward the next generation as we've been able to see across the generations in our service today displayed in so many different ways. And then we, it's like we run into a brick wall and are suddenly jarred with the horror that somebody who was seeking to, to provide medical care and serve faithfully those who were in China was murdered. Not because he was trying to overthrow a government, not, not because he had taken something that wasn't his but because he wanted to tell others about the good news of Jesus Christ and because he himself was living that out, doing good to others. And it would be easy enough to skip those stories and just celebrate. But the reality is you you walk in days and I walk in days where the celebration of the day turns to the dark of the night. And every one of us have experienced long 
dark nights, not simply in life, but even as followers of Jesus Christ. Similarly, as we've been walking through the book of Acts, some might think, well, that's just a book about missions, and that's all it really talks about. Well, it does talk about missions. But it does so in the context of daily life. Sometimes those who are serving in other places in the world and even serving here locally and engaged in a, in a, in a particular perspective of missions, the, the thought is that they have some sort of holy halo around them and that they don't have the normal things of life happening to them. They don't get flat tires. They don't get colds. They never have conflict in their families. Finances are always easy. And every goal they set, well, obviously it's for God's glory and they are simply blessed and it all happens easily. Yet Tina and I know, having served in those capacities, you bury loved ones. You say goodbye from afar. You, you have things happen in your life that, well, it may seem even at the time was very frustrating and kind of then became a funny story. We had license plates on the front and back of our vehicle as most in Europe and Eastern Europe have. You have to have both license plates or you get pulled over and get a ticket. And it's not uncommon for somebody to steal one or both of those license plates. And the vehicle we were using, one of those license plates got stolen. No big deal. Just go down to DMV, spend a little bit of money, maybe an hour, you're out and you're done. No. Three solid back-to-back -back days just to get a blasted license plate. So difficult it became that it won it because I had to go to multiple offices to fill out all the pieces of paperwork. In one of the offices, they have a form taped to the window. The lady behind the window says, I need you to submit this form. I said, okay, be glad to do that. Give me the form and I'll fill it out. She said, there's the form. <laughs> um, I don't have the form. I need a copy of the form. She said, that's the only copy we have. Well, how am I supposed to fill that out? That's not my problem. I literally, and, and so, the, you know, we didn't have camera phones then. I literally came back with a sheet of paper, stood there at the window, wrote down the form, then fill, and all of this is in Russian, and then fill it out, and then submit it only to be told, I have to go to another office once you've filled the form out. And, and while that might be a little humorous, it was not humorous at all in the moment, we tend to think that those who are walking in missions walk in a holy halo, and that nothing of the dark night comes into their lives. But in some ways, they live in a perpetual dark night. And so as we look into this passage today, I want you to see not simply the glorious work of God to, to, to save people, to advance the gospel. I, I want us to see that, but I want us to see more than that. And I don't want you simply to see the Apostle Paul doing extraordinary ministry like, well, missionaries are supposed to do. The fact of the matter is, what God is showing us here is what day-to-day -day life is when you live on mission. And not simply the Apostle Paul, <coughs> but all of us are to live on mission. And every one of us have had long, dark nights. It seems like that migraine is the absolute worst at night. It, it seems like that pain in your body is the absolute worst at night. It seems like that, that heaviness over that situation you're facing, it was difficult during the day, but when it becomes dark, it seems like it almost is overwhelming. Now, how do we live in that? Does God's word have anything to say to us about that? Well, if you'll turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 16 or scroll, them, scroll there on the page that you may have, we're going to look in a few moments at what God's word says here. <clears throat> and I want you to know on the front end, there are no wasted nights. There are no wasted nights. 
It is a guaranteed reality that you and I are going to experience dark nights and some of them are going to feel exceptionally long and certainly cold. But I want you to know that in the midst of those, God has divine purpose, glorious purposes, joyful purposes in the midst of that. And if you and I will see what God is showing us here, oh my, you will look at your dark nights in such a different perspective. So, instead of reading this whole passage to you, I'm going to break it up in chunks. And I want to share some key principles here that you and I need to see. See, ultimately, the Apostle Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke, they have been proclaiming the good news in Philippi. And as they're, they're meeting with Lydia and those who have become believers, and they're all now meeting in Lydia's house, and it's where the whole word house church comes from. They were meeting in her house, one of many she apparently, and we have archaeological evidence of this, she was a woman who likely was of good means, great means. She had a good bit of, of wealth with her. Her home would not have been a, a three-bedroom, two-bath condo. In fact, it likely would have had a courtyard actually in the center of it, and it would have probably been of the size that a church that had upwards of 120 to 150 people could have actually met at her house. That would have not been uncommon. Sometimes when we think of house church, we think of this, well, it's a group of six people meeting in somebody's living room. Can be, but not necessarily. And so they've been meeting in Lydia's house. They're seeing many more people come to Christ. Paul and his team are going about the community and they're proclaiming the good news. And this young girl begins following them. She's a diviner. She is one who through the dark spirits tells prophecies and her pimp spiritually, essentially her owner, is making significant money off of her. And he is using her to tell people's future, their fortunes, so that one, he can become wealthier, and two, they can feel at least some measure of comfort, thinking that they know what's going to come in the future. She is actually possessed by demons. In fact, when God's word talks about her as one having a spirit of divination, the original language actually says she has the spirit of a python. Now, y'all already know right there, I don't like this. It, it truly does. For in Greek legend, there was this idea that there was this python who could foretell the future, and Apollo ultimately kills this python. I like Apollo for that. But what this woman is described as, as one who is in essence indwelt by the spirit of this python who is giving divination. And that's what God's word says. She is going along behind Paul and his team crying out, these men are the servants of the most high God. They proclaim to you the way of salvation. Now, you and I read that and think, well, what would they be upset about that about? Wouldn't they want that said? Well, the reality is, in that setting, it meant something very different. For the Greeks understood an idea of salvation. There were many saviors who would come and go. There, that, that idea of a most high God was spoken of, of many, not simply the God of the Bible. What she is doing is creating confusion. And she is ultimately, by the power of Satan himself, equating the God of the universe with all of the man-made, human-made gods. He is simply one of them. She is taking their message and making it no longer a divine proclamation as best she can and turning it into nothing more than a demonic human proclaimed gibberish. Ultimately, Paul turns, tells this demon spirit in her to come out. And in the power of God, the spirit is cast out of the girl. She is no longer giving 
divine prophecies or demonic prophecies. Her owners become enraged. They go to the magistrates of the the area of Philippi. They raise a real stink with them and ultimately Paul and Silas of the four are arrested, taken in, and they are beaten. The magistrates had a symbol in that day of their rule and control. It was a bundle of rods wrapped with red ribbon that had an axe handle down in it with an axe head. They didn't use the axe to actually do anything with, but rather it was a symbol of their authority and power of the rods, however. The rods, they would undo the bundle and they would take the rods and they would use those rods to actually inflict punishment. And they did that with Paul and Silas. They they didn't simply open their hands and pat their hands hard. They beat them until they bled and were scarred. They then ordered that they be thrown into prison. And the prison guard not only takes them into prison, but he actually puts their feet in shackles could have been one of a couple things. They could have been shackled with chains and, and, and um, uh, those placed around their ankles and where they were essentially chained to the wall. It could have also been something like a stockade where they're on the ground and their feet go in it and then it closes down over the top of them so that they're unable to stand. They're unable to move much. It could have been either of those. And there they are in that prison. They are in not only the physical night of the day, they are in a dark night. They have simply done what God has called them to do and they are seeking to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. They have been falsely accused as those who were trying to raise a riot, an insertion against the Roman government, trying to ultimately lead people away from truth they have been beaten not just slandered but beaten and now they are imprisoned it's cold there's no heat they likely have not been fed or given any medical care or water it's about midnight and this is a profound thing God's word says that in that moment at that time Paul and Silas were singing and praying. The overflow of their hearts, of the joy of the Lord coming out of their hearts in the midst of that dark night is an incredible teaching moment for you and for me. The the rest of the prisoners hear them. They're listening. This makes no sense. You, You and I need to understand with clarity that what God has not simply called us to, but what God has done in us and indwelling us with his Holy Spirit leads to something that this world cannot replicate or understand. They're not complaining. They're not whining. They're not accusing. They're not slandering. They're not griping. They're not moaning. Do they hurt? Of course they hurt. Do they know what the days ahead hold for them? They do not know. And yet they are singing and praying. Imagine the circumstances. In the midst of that, an earthquake occurs. Some people think that this is where a miracle has taken place. They've seen a miracle with Paul casting this demon out of this young girl. And now an even greater miracle. There is an earthquake that has happened. And the, the, the stockade that they're in is opened and the jail doors are open. And not just theirs, but all of them. But friends, I need you to hear this clearly from me. There is a profound miracle that we often gloss over that is greater than all of these. It is the miracle of the work that God had done in Paul and Silas's life and in their hearts such that when all of this had happened to them, they are not trying to figure out how to pick the locks or how to slip their feet out or how to bribe somebody or how to overpower someone. They are praising joyfully their God. That is the evidence of a divine miracle that only can regeneration and new birth bring about? It's powerful. And you say, well, I don't know about it. Let me ask you something. 
this afternoon, you've gone to lunch somewhere and you're headed home and somebody runs you off the road. All very possible. You get, well, just sort of out of it for a minute and you sort of lose control and you decide to run back at them. You've lost your mind in a moment. Normally you'd never do anything like that, but you have. And the next thing you know, you've both been in a wreck and police come and now you've been arrested. And you get put in a jail cell with a lot of other people and while nobody's looking in there, somebody in that jail cell really hurts you, beats you. Let me ask you, are you going to be seen and praying in that moment? You may be singing, but it won't be hymns and praise courses. You may be praying, but it'll be more like imprecatory prayers against somebody. You see, what this is showing us here is not something extraordinary. This isn't really even about missions. It is about life and God's work in the midst of our lives in all things, in all dark nights, and what he desires to do in us and through us. Keep in mind, as we read the book of Acts, this isn't simply a, a, a historical account of extraordinary missionary movements of the church. This is the account of the church living in the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. That's all it is. In fact, the name of the book wasn't given divinely. It is one that faithful people have come up with, Acts, but it is fully Acts of the Apostles. The reality is we could say it is Acts of the Lord Jesus Christ and the life of the Apostles and all the disciples who followed Jesus. They come to, or the, the jailer then is afraid for in that day, if the, the prisoners escaped, the jailer would be held accountable with capital punishment. The jailer immediately prepares and he takes his own sword and he prepares literally to fall down on it and to end his own life. For he knows that is what is coming to him. It demonstrates that he is a man loyal to the command that has been given him and he has taken it utmost seriously. Paul cries out to him and says, don't, don't do this. We're all here. And it's amazing. It's not simply the Paul and Silas are there. All the other prisoners are still there. None of them have run away. So profound was the effect of the Apostle Paul and Silas on the other prisoners, not their preaching, not their defense of the gospel, but simply the joy in the midst of a dark night. So profound it was that it captivated those around them. They wanted to stay and see the rest of the show. I mean, if this is what's happened, what do you think's coming next? The jailer then comes rushing into Paul and Silas. He knows something dramatic has happened. He knows his life physically is still on, line, on the line. And yet in the moment of talking about the physical safety of his life, there's also a conversation spiritually taking place. And he cries out to them, what must I do to be saved? In that moment, the Apostle Paul looks at Silas and says, hey, do you have one of those tracts they give out at church last week? I need to share with him one of those tracts. He didn't. Did Paul then pull out his phone and say, hey, I want to share with you an app that this will walk it? No. Did he then give his phone number, to, uh, the phone number of Peter to the, to the jailer and say, hey, if you'll call him, he'll answer all of your questions. This afternoon at four o'clock, we're going to do good news training. I have asked our entire church to make this a priority and to come and be with us. We're going to have a family meal at the end of it at 515. We're going to have city barbecue and it's going to be great. This will really encourage you and help you. But my brothers and sisters, I want you to understand here very clearly and simply, ultimately what God's word shows us here and what God says is, Paul tells him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. How simple, how profound. Satan has told us 
an innumerable number of lies of what the gospel is and is not and all that is necessary for you to be able to share the good news with someone. Yes, could we go on and on and talk about how God has fulfilled the, the promise of salvation given all the way back in Genesis and then pick up in Isaiah and all that God says about in Isaiah and that he has fulfilled it in Jesus. Yes, we could do all of those things. But when you boil it down, salvation is as simple as this. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, period. And anyone, everyone who genuinely does that because every one of us are desperately in need of being saved. Every person on this planet will never be good enough in their own strengths, their own abilities, their own plans, their own devices, their own education, their own philanthropic efforts. Nothing they will ever do will be good enough to save them. There is one way and only one way. Jesus himself said it. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In that moment, the jailer believed. God's word says, and they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them, the jailer, the same night and he washed their wounds and he baptized. And they were, him and his entire house were baptized and he brought them in the house and he fed them and he rejoiced along with the entire household that he had believed in God. They go back to the jail. Are, are you tracking with me? They, after having been cared for and their wounds cleaned and bandaged, Paul and Silas go back to the jail. The magistrates send for them. They want to continue their abuse. Paul and Silas ultimately tell them, um, you may tell us that we could go, but we got a problem here. Roman citizens... And you can't do this to a Roman citizen. In fact, you have violated yourselves Roman law. And the magistrates become very unnerved and upset themselves. And they come to Paul and Silas. It's interesting. They come to Paul and Silas. And they apologize. They apologize. And they tell them, please, just leave. Just go. Get out of the city. We just don't want you here anymore. Now again, if you and I, after having come through a dark night like this, remember that every time Paul and Silas got up, their bandages pulled and their bodies hurt. Their legs are still so stiff from having been in shackles. They're not walking very fast. They've been up most of the night. And instead of saying, hey, let's get out of here as quickly as we can, they then go to Lydia's house and meet with the church. I've said over and over and over and over again in this series that the church is central in terms of the gathered body of believers. I, I'm just compelled to say that whether you're watching online or whether you're in this service now or you watch this in days ahead, but when we take our gathering together as a body so casually, when any and everything can become a priority other than us gathering together, what are we telling the next generation? Are we not saying that the example we have of normal life in the Bible is not the best and right way? Are we not telling our children that game, that party, that event, that gathering, that lake is more important than the Bible and God's people and his word? Are we not setting that up as an example? Indeed we are. And they see 
this beautiful body of Christ. And Paul and Silas encourage them. Lydia and that group of believers no doubt demonstrated extraordinary hospitality to them and they wanted to care for Paul and Silas and yet what Paul and Silas did, they did not come to that body that that body might serve them. They came that they in that moment at the end of that dark night might be servants to that body. If you and I will change how we think of dark nights, it will so utterly change how we see life And our church families, it will lead you to a place of joy that no self-help book or podcast or gathering will ever, ever be able to fulfill you. When your relationship with Jesus Christ is based first first and foremost about here's what I need to do, here's what I don't need to do, you will never taste this kind of victory and this kind of joy. But when you walk with him, when you talk with him, when you really commune with the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't need any self-help when you find yourself in the middle of the dark night. You've got the helper with you who promised you and me, just like it was quoted by Joseph in that last verse that we did in the Bible drill. All authority on heaven and earth has been given me. You hang on to that. In the middle of your dark night, it's not out of control. Evil has not won. Pain has not become the victory. Jesus still has absolute authority over everyone and everything in the midst of every dark night. We watch what's happening in the Middle East and in Eastern Europe. We hear the saber rattling happening in Iran, Persia, and in North Korea, and in Africa, and in China. And we wonder, Lord, are these the days? Are you coming back soon? And what he says to us again and again, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons, but it is for you to know all authority has been given to me on heaven and in earth. Now go. Don't sit back and wait. Don't be afraid of dark nights. Don't live in fear. Don't hunker down. Go, go, go. Make disciples. Make disciples. Of all nations. Oh God, that we would make disciples of those who call themselves Hamas and those who would call themselves Jews. And those who would call themselves Iranians and Persians and North Koreans and Russians and Ukrainians. Go, go and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And teach them everything I have commanded. Not simply John 3.16. Everything including what I am showing you here in Acts. How you and I ought to live as normal followers of Jesus Christ. What is normal Christianity? So that even in the midst of the dark night. I have told you not to be afraid. So don't be afraid. I have told you to abide in me so that my joy may abide in you. So abide in me all the time, every time, everywhere, so that even in the dark night, my joy may abide in you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And in your dark night, you will be my witnesses. I want to share with you just thoughts to walk away with. God's people see the demonic war. We understand that what happens in the dark nights ultimately is the result not of human hands and human uh, intentions and designs and plans. These things aren't accidents or coincidences. But what we see is Satan as though he were moving chess pieces around. We are watching it play out in the Middle East. We are watching it play out in Eastern Europe. We are watching it play out in our community and in our homes. 
you and I see that what is behind all these things is the spirit of the python who is not the spirit of truth but is a liar. He has come to kill, steal, and to destroy. Ultimately, even as what we see the charges against the Apostle Paul and, and, and Silas is that ultimately there was prejudice against them and Excuse me, they were accused of causing lawlessness that actually resulted in lawlessness and then an abuse of power and that's Satan's scheme all along. He wants to divide us by looking at one another differently and for us to become prejudiced against one another and he fans those flames. Oh, he wants there to be lawlessness among us where some are favored and others are not, where some have a law unto themselves and, well, others have a law unto themselves as well, where ultimately person against person comes against one another and ultimately all along he is trying to extend his power into all of these things. You and I, as God's people, we see what is going on. This is a demonic war happening around us, even in our own midst. God's people respond with faith and joy. Ultimately, in James, God's word says, count it great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials. Is that not what we see Paul and Silas doing? Count it great joy. Count it great joy. It's not that you and I can check a box. Okay, I'm in jail, I'm in a dark night, I'm going to be joyful. It is that you and I live in the midst of a life perspective that there is a demonic war happening around me at all times. And that warrior, that demonic warrior, though powerful, though cunning, will never ultimately be victorious. He may kill, still, and destroy this body, but he cannot take or destroy what is ultimately eternal. And God's people also persevere with purpose. It's extraordinary. In the midst of these things, they didn't turn their eye gates solely on them. They didn't say when the, 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 the jailer said, what must I do to be saved? They didn't clam up and say, well, you think we're going to help you now? After what you've done? In the midst of everything they're walking through, in the midst of their dark night, they are living with a gospel purpose. Every situation in which you find yourself, there is purpose for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jocko Wilnick is a celebrated Navy SEAL. He's written a number of books. He's a tremendous leader of leaders. He has a very common practice and he developed this while he was serving in Iraq, leading SEAL teams and involved in some of the most dangerous missions that could be involved when, when other soldiers would come to him or even when his, uh, those above him, he was a commander himself, but those above him would come to him with bad news, hard news, difficult news, even deadly news. His response is good, good. And it wasn't just a simple stoic, I'm just going to say good, because he had an absolute conviction that no matter how hard it was, how difficult it was, no matter how high the cost, that there would be some good that ultimately would come out of this. Listen, you and I have a power in us that is far greater than any neighbor seal was ever able to conjure up. It is the living spirit of God himself. And every time we find ourselves in the midst of a dark night, no matter what is thrown at us, no matter what Satan does, we ought to say good. Because you may have intended it for evil, but God intends this for good. No matter what you decide to try to destroy, God ultimately will use this for his purposes. We ought to live that way and proclaim the good news in the midst of all of these things. And then finally, God's people taste the fruit of the kingdom. It's an extraordinary thing. They ultimately were tasting God's goodness to them for them to be released And when they were released, they went back to Lydia's house and instead of finding a group of believers who were afraid, who'd run away, instead of finding people who goes, well, I can't come today, I'm not gonna be there because y'all saw what they did to Paul and Silas and man, that might happen to us and we're not gonna go, you know, the Lord will understand. No, the church gathered there in strength and in commitment. The apostle Paul and Silas got to taste the goodness 
of the fruit of the kingdom of God as he saw those young believers sold out for Jesus, unwilling, unwilling to walk in a life of fear. And they fellowshiped with them and they encouraged them and then ultimately they went on their way. They saw and tasted the fruit of the kingdom that even in the midst of that dark night in that jail, God saved that jailer and all of his family. Dear friends, have you thought about whatever dark night you're walking in? Have you really thought about the fact that God intends to do good through it, even though you don't know when or how or with whom? It ought to encourage you not to give up, not to grow faint, not to be timid, but to have an absolute conviction of confidence that no matter what comes, God will use this for good. I will not fear because my God never wastes a night. If today you need to receive Jesus Christ and you're like that Philippian jailer and what's on your heart is, how can I be saved? I share with you the same thing that my brother Paul said. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ right now. With all of your heart, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Father, thank you for your word and for reminding us that the God of this age, Satan, roars about and he causes and influence nights of darkness all across this planet and throughout our lives. Father, thank you for reminding us that you don't waste any of those And in the midst of that, ordinary followers of Jesus can live with extraordinary joy and hope because we abide in our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, Father, I pray today, call out those who desire to be saved. Open their hearts that they may believe today. Father, I pray that they would cry out to you in this moment, Oh God, save me. I believe Jesus died for me. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Would you stand and sing this great hymn of the faith? Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. folks for joining us this morning and for sharing in this wonderful, wonderful morning of worship of our Savior. Wow. The night may be rough, but joy comes in the morning and morning by morning, new mercies. Wow. What a promise we have to face tomorrow. So may God richly bless you tomorrow, get you through tonight and tomorrow morning, his mercies will be new. Amen. Don't miss next Sunday. Be with us as we challenge our last Sunday of Missions Month and J.D. Bush as our ordination. Now, thank you for joining us. In just a moment, I'm going to dismiss our live stream, friends. And I'm going to ask the church body to sit as we go into, move into quarterly.
Church Conference.